Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar, Murderers, Pedophiles, and Other Harm Concerns, Living with Possibilities, with Jonathan B. Grayson, Ph.D. I am Mary Geis. I'm Director of Programs here at ADAA. Before we get started, I would like to go over a few items so you know how to participate in today's event. We've taken a screenshot of an example of the attendee interface. You should see something that looks like this. On, the, um, on your own computer desktop in the upper right corner. You've joined the presentation listening using your computer speaker system by default. If you would prefer to join over the telephone, just select telephone in the audio pane and the dial-in information will be displayed. You will have the opportunity to submit text questions to today's presenter by typing your questions into the chat pane of the control panel. You may send in your questions at any time. We will collect these and address them during the Q&A session at the end of today's presentation. Our speaker will be presenting four letters, both verbally and visually, throughout the presentation. If you have registered and paid for continuing ed education credit, you will need to provide these on the webinar evaluation. And now it is my pleasure to introduce to you Dr. Grayson. Uh, Dr. Grayson is a licensed psychologist, director of the Grayson Se Center, and adjunct clinical assistant professor of psychiatry and the behavioral sciences at the University of Southern California, where he lectures and supervises residents. He has been specializing in the treatment of OCD for more than 35 years and is a nationally recognized expert and author of Freedom from Obsessive Compulsive Disorder, a personalized recovery program for living with uncertainty, which is a self-help guide for sufferers. He has also presented workshops and written numerous articles and book chapters for both professional and lay audiences. His work and expertise have been featured in national media, including People Magazine, The Oprah Winfrey Show, and Nightline. In 1981, along with Gail Frankel, he started the first support group in the country for OCD. In 2015, he helped to form and donate his time to a free goal support group in LA, and he has the distinction of being the first and possibly the only professional to run a yearly OCD camping trip. And last but certainly not least, he has been an active member of ADAA since 1985. I'm gonna just take a brief moment to pass the screen to our experts. I assume this means I have the screen now. You will, yes, now you should. Now I should. All right, good morning, everyone. It's really weird for me to be talking to a computer camera where I can't see myself or anyone else. I have to remember to do things like not pick my nose because you can actually see me. I'm sure somebody will let me know. So today we'll be going to be focusing on harm OCD in its various lovely forms. And uh, I'm going to break this talk into three parts. Okay, the very first part will be the theory of what is OCD. And be clear, when I'm describing a theory of what I think OCD is, it is consistent not only with cognitive behavior therapy, but with the cognitive therapy, aspect, cognitive therapy aspects of uh, treatment and with ACT techniques. Uh, just want to make it clear, this is not a behavioral approach versus other approaches, but how to incorporate these approaches into the treatment of uh, exposure response prevention for OCD. Um, and again, when I'm talking to clients in other locations, when they're looking for treatment for OCD, I always tell them that what they need to be looking for is that somewhere the person says they actually do exposure response prevention for OCD. CBT is comprised of many techniques, and not all of them are suitable for OCD. Um, in general, when we get to this part, I'm going to try to keep it short because I'm assuming everybody here has at least an intermediate understanding of CBT and of OCD. The second part is going to be helping clients to understand the goals of treatment and gaining their agreement to be in treatment. This is critical. Too often people start treatment uh, before the person is really agreed. So when I'm talking about gaining their compliance and agreement, for many clients this might be one or two sessions. There are other clients for whom this might be three months. I will not start treatment until I'm sure that they actually agree to the goals of treatment. And the third part, uh, the part you've all been waiting for in a sense, what are the specific rationales and kinds of ERP we do for these manifestations of OCD? So, the core of OCD. So I make the assumption that the prime problem in OCD is for the client is wanting to be 100% certain uh, in the area where they're having a problem. Or to put it another way, that the underlying problem is intolerance of uncertainty. 
and this is a critical assumption. A few weeks ago at ADAA's um, conference, I was asked a question by uh, someone in the audience who had treated somebody with pedophile OCD, and she had done all kinds of exposure, and she came to the point saying it wasn't working because the client, when she did all the exposure and all the mindfulness and all the way she incorporated ACT, the client still didn't understand that she had OCD and was not a pedophile. Now, the wonderful thing or terrible thing here is it immediately became clear to me why treatment didn't work. Because the goal of doing everything is that the client should learn to live with uncertainty. So, and trying to have the client understand that it's OCD and not pedophilia, she was essentially trying to reassure the client. So, of course, it didn't work. Or, I'm reminded of another young man that I speak about. And, Dr. Uh, Grace, I apologize for interrupting, but um, your slides aren't up yet. If you could please share your screen. Okay, we share the, are you seeing any of them? No, I see you. We're not seeing the slides. Great. Now? Not yet. Oh. And and how many slides have you missed? Um, everything. Cool. I see them now, though. You are all set. We have an hour and a half today, so we're good. Go ahead. Okay. Just just the just the brief like that was the first outside of the intro. That was the first slide you missed. Going over what I said, and by the way, I will make these slides available so that people can download them. I'll, I'll send them to you later. The second slide you missed. Oh no, now I'm off track. Um, well, we'll hope that I'm not one slide ahead of myself. Um, I just told you about the guy with the pedophilia. There was another young man who uh, a therapist brought to my office. And his problem was he did not like the fact that he or his family could be harmed at any time. And so I asked him, um, you know, does he accept the goal of treatment? And after torturing a while with what that was, I said, well, the goal of treatment is for you to be happy in a world where you or your family might die at any time. I don't want that. And I looked at him and said, okay, tell me the alternative. And he laughed because, right, there is no alternative. I said, this is great. Now we know why you weren't getting better. Because although you were doing exposure, you had some other goal in mind. So you're not, you don't have some particularly virulent form of OCD. There's not some horrible defect that you have that you can't get better. You simply were working on the wrong goal. And at that point, he did something really sad. He refused to take that goal. He already has admitted there is no other world to live in but he would not take the goal, so he left with his therapist, and he did not get better. If I had been treating him, I would have done no exposure until we had gotten him to agree that this is what he wants to work on. So this is where I run into trouble with the... There we go. Okay. So when we're talking about, again, this, this issue, cognitive therapy has many good techniques, but it's really important when you're working with OCD that you do not take your own biases too seriously. So imagine you're treating somebody with social anxiety and they're saying, I worry that if I go into a room, some people might not like me. Well, right, some people might not like them. You're not going to base your therapy on trying to reassure them that everyone there will like them. You will probably try to convince them to be comfortable with some people disliking them. Now, if I have the fear that maybe my thoughts will kill people, even though I know it's not likely, many CT therapists will then want to talk about the probability of that and how that's not possible. That is wrong. That is you deciding what the client's problem is, not what it really is. Remember, the problem with OCD is intolerance of uncertainty. And it doesn't matter if it's really likely or not very likely. Uh, one of the caveats that's included in this is that we do not do behavioral experiments. So, that example I just gave. I did have a person who worried that her thoughts might kill people, and she had a great reason for depleting this. She saw on TV a report saying that people in hospitals who were being prayed for did better than people who were not being prayed for. Now, I believe that she correctly concluded that if you can help people with your prayers and thoughts, you can harm them. It was a crappily done study that she heard about, but of course, why should she know that? So she spent 24-7 trying to make sure that 
She was not thinking killing thoughts, undoing any killing thoughts that she might have had. So she was pretty miserable. When she came to my office and said she was worried that her thoughts might kill people, my response was, well, maybe they can. But we do know that you have a low hit rate. So we discussed this and I said, so our goal in treatment, you know, we're going to do a lot of exposure and I'm going to have you think a lot about trying to kill people. And we're going to try to kill people. But the goal of this treatment is not to prove that you can't kill people. The goal is for you to get comfortable with these thoughts because obviously it's driving you crazy trying to avoid these thoughts. Now, it might be in the course of treatment, someone will die. And if someone dies, you don't get to know whether you did it or not, but we would urge you to stay in treatment. Let's say you knock off a second person, really unlucky, but I still want you to stay in treatment. You can knock off three people, and it's got to be three separate occasions. You kill a busload of people, that's one. You knock off three people, three separate occasions, we'll try to figure out something else to do. And contact the CIA because they will probably have some use for you. First week of treatment, we worked on killing her dad. He did die at the end of the week. He had been sick, but nobody, he was in the no risk for dying and he died. Now, as I tell you this, I'm asking you the question, did she kill him? And for all of you who might responded immediately, no, my question is, well, how do you know? You don't. She stayed in treatment. Again, treatment took into account intolerance of uncertainty. This might happen. We don't get to know why or why not. If I had been trying to do a behavioral experiment, now what do I say to her? After assuring her that it really can happen, well, maybe it did. People with OCD are really smart. The fact that I did something and no disaster happened today doesn't tell me anything about tomorrow. Okay, sorry, I'm, okay. So, I will use cognitive therapy techniques in the service of living with uncertainty. I'll be covering this a little bit more, but you know, we'll be doing things like using Socratic reasoning to prove that rituals don't work. Because whatever a person's rituals are, I assure you I can find the flaw in those rituals. And I'll point to those inconsistencies in their behavior. And the person will go say, well, that doesn't bother me. And I'll say, that is great. Because you know, with OCD, the measure of severity is consistency. The more consistent you are, the more dysfunctional you are. So it's great that you're not, you know, 100% consistent. But I want you to be aware that logically that means your rituals don't make sense. Either you need to get crazier, in which I promise you I will find still find inconsistencies in your rituals, or give up and accept that your rituals don't actually work. That you do all of this and you don't even get the prize. Again, so I'm using Socratic reasoning, but not to say you know, you shouldn't, your OCD won't happen, but that there's no way to avoid it. Basically, any technique that provides reassurance that their fears won't happen or the probab probability is low is neutralizing and should be avoided. And now we're really, okay, sorry, I couldn't see the slide. This is the exciting E slide, the first of Four slides that tell you, oh, you should really be paying attention here if you want extra, if you want uh, continuing credit. Act. I will discuss this very briefly um, in terms of how to incorporate Act. And as I'm speaking today, you will notice that some of the things, even if I don't refer to Act specifically, you'll be able to. Okay. You'll be able to put it in act terms and say, yes, you know, he's doing diffusing, he's doing this. And if you make that accusation of what I'm doing, you are actually correct. That is exactly what I'm doing. Okay. So, very briefly, act is a top-down approach. That is, rather than starting at the core of the problem, it kind of starts with trying to help the person change their entire view of the world. Right? We're going to have them diffuse and really try to change how they look at everything, what are their values. And the thought is that by changing this overall worldview, 
that when it comes to kind of working on the core of their problem, it's going to be easy, it's going to be very natural for them to do that. I'm suggesting that with OCD, we're going to go in the reverse direction. I am not going to start with it from the top down. I'm going to start from the bottom up. Now, I am going to be employing ACT ideas. But rather than talking about kind of a global defusing of all ideas, I'm really just going to be applying that to their OCD. Again, if you think about the whole idea of living with uncertainty, if nothing is certain, and that includes one's thoughts, already we've taken a giant step towards diffusion. If I can't trust my thoughts and can't trust reality, everything is pretty relative. So this is not this is not anti-act doing it in this approach. As Hayes would tell you, he is for incorporating any technique that empirically makes sense. The issue is not act or you know, or not act, or act versus o, or ERP. It is which of two ways is it best to apply act when working with OCD? That's an empirical question. Currently, you know, nobody has done that study. My reasoning is very simple. If I'm treating an alcoholic, I have to have the guy sober before I work on all their other issues. With OCD, many of the person's problems are so great and so attention demanding that until he gets some, he or she gets some control over their OCD and the way they respond to it, they are not going to be able to hear the greater message. Another caveat is that you will never say this very favorite act saying that a thought is just a thought. And there's a very simple reason, right? Part of defusing is that we're trying to help the person think in a very non-judgmental way to really accept how our thoughts can basically be anything and how they modify how we experience things. But with OCD, if I say a thought is just a thought, that it's actually a very judgmental statement. Many people with OCD, I hope that you can hear the trash cans outside. If so, it's going to be a second that you're going to have to be stuck here now. Anyway, with OCD, to say a thought is just a thought is very judgmental. Many sufferers, they are begging and hoping that that's what they can say. If you have pedophile OCD, if I'm worried about killing my spouse, often one of the rituals is it's just OCD. Because if it's just OCD, I've heard somewhere that people with OCD don't do this stuff. Therefore, because they don't do this stuff, I don't have to worry. But maybe it's not OCD. So that becomes a ritual. So we're never going to say that to them. And I'll be speaking more of this when we get to um, you know, acting treatment, when we get to treatment of these problems. Uh, just briefly, I don't know, I skipped two slides or if you missed the slide. Anyway, for somebody who wants to just look at more of this, um, here's a reference for where you can find uh, more about a discussion of using ACT with uh, ERP for OCD. Uh, the same discussion is in the updated edition of my book. So obtaining compliance from patients. Generally, when I'm working with a client, uh, in the beginning, it's always going to be pretty much the same. Uh, my first session, I generally ask them, what is the core of OCD? Right? Because they know they're suffering, they know they're anxious, and quite often they'll say it's repeating, it's fear. They'll say a lot of things, and I'll say, yes, that is not the core. These things occur in other problems. That the core of OCD is wanting to be 100% certain in the area of your problem. Absolutely certain your hands are clean. Absolutely certain you won't kill someone. Absolutely certain that you're gay or that you're not gay, depending on your initial orientation. This is incredibly relieving to people. Up to the point of coming to treatment, no matter what they've heard about OCD, if they have not heard this, their OCD seems crazy to them. They, they know something, but they don't know something, and they can't understand what is wrong. But in this term, it suddenly becomes very clear. I will ask them, do you know why you can't be certain? And um, some people will very quickly guess the answer, which is nothing is certain. Other people, you know, I have to tell them. And it happens that the research has shown that the only people who are certain are stupid. 
and I don't know how to make you stupid. So you're going to have to be stuck living with OCD. And I will ask them a whole bunch of other questions to kind of push home this point. I will ask, you know, is your spouse alive? And of course they'll say yes, and the answer is like, how do you know? Couldn't they have died five minutes ago? You know, I, I talked to them, and it's like, so they could be dead right now. Do you need to call them on the phone to find out if they're alive? And of course they'll say no. Said, huh. I'll ask, do you want to be maimed, paralyzed, and disfigured? They, of course, hopefully, say no, and it's like, okay, that's good. How'd you get here? You drove. So you risk some idiot ramming your car and leaving you in that state, even though you're actually telling me you're certain you don't want that to happen. And your brilliant plan for dealing with this, I'll wait till I'm being crushed under the metal. So note the difference between these issues and normal OCD handling or abnormal OCD handling of a problem. In real life, when we're afraid of something, like I don't want to be maimed and killed in a car crash, but what we do is we wait for it to happen. With OCD, I want to know right now exactly. So our goal is to help you learn to live with uncertainty. And we know you can do it because there are all these other areas of your life that you do do that. So, um, let's see. We will, I will also, sorry, I'm sorry, it's very hard not seeing you guys. I also asked the person in your previous treatments, many people have been through an OCD treatment program, some through intensive programs at what I would have thought were reputable places. And I'll ask, was the goal there to live with uncertainty? And they will say no. Now maybe they didn't hear it, or maybe they weren't told it. But again, go back to the guy I was speaking about earlier who didn't want to didn't like the world where he or his family might die at any time. He went through treatment thinking that somehow doing exposure was going to magically make him know that they can never die. In his particular case, that's not even a possibility. So when they say this, though, you have a great edge with the client. Because if they've never worked on trying to learn to live with uncertainty, they have reason to have hope that your treatment will work. Because not only are you offering ERP, but you are now offering something different. And honestly, between the how positive they feel from the idea that uncertainty is the underlying problem, in the sense that it all makes sense to them now, and that they actually haven't tried to do this before, that they have a reason to risk hope. Now, when we're talking about certainty, you know, what you have to remember for you and for them, certainty is a feeling. It is not a fact. Certainty is something that correlates with reality. You know, all of you, you're inside somewhere, you assume your car is not stolen. It probably isn't. You assume your loved ones are alive, they probably are. You make a lot of assumptions every moment, and they always seem right. And that's because most often they are right, but that is a correlation. People with OCD, like all of us, want to have that feeling of certainty. Think of this. When people get married on their wedding day, unless they're psycho, they expect to be married forever. And if they are married for 50 blissful years, that was a good guess. Because what I'm going to argue is everything you believe is always a guess. And you find the answer to your guess is when it's too late. So 50 years later, we're still married. It's great. I made a good guess 50 years ago. If we get married and one year later we're divorced after a horrible nightmare of a marriage, I guess wrong. Seven blissful years followed by three years of hell, I don't know what to call that, but the answer to the guess of we're going to be married forever came after ten years. So everything is a guess. And this guess that we'll be married forever, 50% of the people who get married, it's the wrong guess. That's our divorce rate. So I like to point out to people this feeling that you want of certainty that because everything will be safe really means nothing because it is just a feeling. It is not fact. Logic is very nice and people with OCD actually are very logical if you accept their basic premise. 
and you accept the premise that truly nothing is certain. That happens to be a belief that I hold to as highly likely. Uh, but they have to remember that logic does not change feelings. And that for every logical answer I have, there is a what if. So, and, and think about this when we're talking about logic. Go back to your Psych 1 course to the famous bell and shock. I put a shock electrode on your hand, ring a bell and shock you. Right, and after a while you jump when I just ring the bell. I take the shock electrode off and logic says, I'm not going to have any pain. And you ring the bell and I jump. Feelings do not change from logic. Logic, however, gives me a reason to go against what my feelings are telling me. As one of my clients once said, they do not have a choice whether or not they have OCD. But they do get to choose how to respond to it. People with OCD have three traits that they can't get rid of, and OCD misuses them. The first trait, as I mentioned, they are above average intelligence, so it will not be possible to make them stupid enough to believe in certainty. And I really believe that the research has proven that only stupid people um, are certain, witness the past election. People with OCD are creative. I mean, I'll ask them, do you think you're creative? Some no, some don't. And I say, I'm going to prove that you're creative right now and you're going to agree. The core of creativity is two words, what if. Okay, they are masters of creativity. But they make the mistake of thinking creativity is art, all these wonderful nice things. Creativity is survival. Where is the tiger? How can I make sure it doesn't eat me? Where is the tiger? How can I eat it? And in the case of their OCD, in the case of the modern world, it's not only physical survival, it's mental survival. What is a threat to me? So whatever is a threat to me, I will become incredibly vigilant for, and I will look for all the dangers. Presumably, none of us are going to be worried about going outside looking for terrorists. But if in your neighborhood you discover that there are terrorists running around and they're shooting people, if you decide to strangely leave the house, suddenly you will be looking everywhere and trying to figure out all the places they might be. So creativity, evolutionarily, it's survival. Finally, the last trait they have is great imagination. It's thinking about something so vividly it feels real. Well, they scare the hell out of themselves. Now the great thing, these three traits are not their OCD. They have these traits whether or not they have OCD. And so our goal essentially is to get them to enjoy having these traits rather than using them in the service of OCD. And we're getting very close to the most important thing about, you know, OCD thoughts. Because let's face it, with pedophilia and with the uh, maybe I'm going to kill people and all the other forms of harm, OCD thoughts play the major role. Often people refer to these as pure O because they think that they have no behavioral rituals. Or actually, many of them do. No thought can be defined as OCD because of content. It does not matter what that content is. You all may be aware, and I will mention this to sufferers, that there are studies showing that normal people think the same kind of crazy, crazy thoughts that OCD people think. There is no difference. Now, that is not to say to them, now you don't have to worry because you actually could be a killer, but the thought alone does not tell us or prove to us that you are or you are not. So when is a thought OCD? What makes something an OCD thought? And there are two conditions. And the person can do one or both of these. The first, I don't want to have that thought. Well, obviously, if I don't want to have a thought, I have to be vigilant and look out for it because I don't want it to get me. And if I have to look out for it, I will see it. I personally hate the don't think about pink elephants. I don't know why. I try not to think about it. Generally, I will talk to them about when they're driving, how many black cars did they see? And of course, I don't know. And imagine if your assignment is while you're driving, make sure you don't see black cars. And of course, you'll see it. And make sure you don't have this thought, you're doomed. The second, what does this thought mean? That's it. I'm doomed. If I have to know what it means, if it has to mean or not mean something else, there's no proof. Um, I may ask them about the likelihood of the danger they are afraid of. You know, how likely is that you will do X? 
And uh, I do not ask this for reassurance to say, oh, it's low probability, but don't worry about it. Uh, I do say, I just want you to notice all the other things that are at the same level of danger that you don't worry about, and we want to make this like them. You know, they may agree that, uh, you know, car accident, dying in a car accident is more likely than them killing their uh, children. They could point out the car accident could have the kids in the car, so they all get to die anyway. But again, it's, it's not to prove that they're not doing it, it's just to prove, it's just to talk about there is a way you can live with danger. And note that when we're talking about this, just to talk about ACT, there's a little bit of diffusion exposure taking place. Because basically I'm saying your thinking, your judgments will never answer the question, will this thing happen or not? You know, uncertainty means that thought is unreliable. That leads to diffusion. Rituals are useless. Ultimately, we're trying to get them to acceptance. And, and I'm going through all of this because I mean, this is literally what I say to them, so this is literally what I'm hoping you would say to them. And what is acceptance? You know, we all talk about acceptance, and you know, we all have this kind of nice Eastern, like, oh, acceptance, I'm kind of in the in the Zen bliss mode of like everything is great and wonderful and I don't really mind everything, so why wouldn't anybody jump into acceptance? So let me talk about denial to get to acceptance, because you know, before you get to acceptance you're probably in denial. What is denial? And denial, very simply, denial takes place whenever I compare reality to fantasy. Think about it when we always talk about somebody who's lost a family member, they've died. And, you know, we'll say they're in denial about it. What the heck does that mean? They know they're dead. If you accuse them, they're like, no, I'm miserable because they're dead. I'm not in denial, but they are in denial. Because for death, the statement of denial is life would be better if this person were still here. That is a fantasy. They are never coming back. Now, what's really one of the reason I use death as an example is because moving from denial to acceptance, the process of mourning, you don't do it overnight. I don't care how psychologically aware you are, you lose a loved one, you're still starting in denial. You still have to go through this mourning process. And eventually I get to acceptance. So when I'm talking about acceptance and uh, death, the statement of acceptance is they're gone. And that statement is more stark than life would be better if they were still here. Denial always destroys the present. Imagine I'm in the mountains with my wife, looking at a beautiful sunset at a lake, but I'm thinking, oh yeah, but if we were really wealthy, we'd be at St. Bart's in the Caribbean where I could snap my fingers and waiters would come in with a rum punch and it'd be a beautiful Atlantic sunset. And in that moment, I have destroyed this nice time I was having with my wife. Fantasy, always better than reality because we don't put any crap in the fantasy. So moving to acceptance kind of sucks. I have to give up something that I want. Imagine a gambler who stops gambling. Everybody's happy. Yay, your family's going to get back together. You're going to get out of debt. But he's never going to be rich. He never was going to be rich, probably. But he has to let go of the fantasy and be like everyone else. So moving to acceptance is very painful. Now, acceptance initially is depressing. That's the feeling of mourning. But it is less activating than the desperate. It can't be that way. I, got, I don't want it to be that way. Oh, no, it can be that way. So we're going to help somebody move to acceptance. And again, you know, some people, one or two sessions, they're willing to accept the goal. I mean, that does not mean they have accepted, but they, they have accepted that this is the goal. Other people, I'm going to have to work to get them to them at that, to get them to that point. The goal of treatment. I will tell people, if your goal in treatment is to be certain, there is no help for you. The goal is, very simply, to live with uncertainty, without anxiety or rituals, to be free. And now we have another one of those lovely slides. This is the P slide for those of you who want extra credit. So look at the slide, obsess about it. 
And let's move on. So I'm going to start with talking about pedophilia or pedophilia OCD. And again, the very first trick is, is obtaining compliance. Right? The person with pedophile OCD, they are really upset. How do I know I'm not a pedophile? Obviously, everything here is going to be similar for other problems. So, right, you know, this is true if I'm worried about raping somebody or any sexual predator or harmful behavior. Um, how do I know I'm not doing this? You know, and what, and what kind of things am I doing to avoid? Um, you know, my pedophilia, you know, so am I, am I not looking at children, I'm staying away from playgrounds, I have to avoid certain words, and the goal is to learn how to be happy even if you are a pedophile. Sounds a little hard. But the symptoms in this particular form of OCD are very shameful for the person, right, because they feel like they're a freak. And again, they're going to avoid all these things. They're going to avoid all of these issues and avoid playgrounds. They're going to avoid this. And you know what? They can't talk about it. They are correct. Because unless the person understands OCD, unless it's a spouse who's a little more enlightened, you say, I think I might like want to you know, make love to kids, everybody explodes. Everybody's like, okay, stay away from my kid. I don't want you near me. So they, they correctly make that guess. And uh, we're going to talk to them in terms of trying to convince them the normalcy of these thoughts. And you may be thinking, what? The normalcy of these thoughts? Well, we're going to start with a few things. First, I will check with them. Hey, do you have a current plan to try to go and uh, molest little kids tonight? Like where you can tell me, absolutely, that is your plan tonight. And generally, actually, always, they don't. So I say, okay, this doesn't tell me it's not going to happen in the future, but, you know, your lack of a current plan is basically the same as mine. I, I have as much likelihood of being a pedophile as you do. So I hope that I don't molest any kids tonight. I have a grandson. I, I hope I don't do anything to him. But all I know is I don't have that. So I'm going to pretend that it's just a thought. You can pretend that it's just OCD. Normalcy. What do I mean by normalcy? Well, you know, what age are they concerned about? You know, some people, their concern is that the person is just underage. Now, seriously, it's obvious to everybody that there are a lot of 16-year-olds who don't look 16, right? So it's, it's rape or even 15-year-olds. So for these patients, if I say, if I show you a picture of this really sexy person and tell you the person's 21, will you be okay with it? And quite often, they'll be okay with it. And I show you the same picture and say, yep, fooling you, it was really 15. Suddenly, it's like, oh, no, now I have to feel bad. So they're basing their whole concern not on the stimulus in front of them, but their idea about the stimulus. Because let's face it, it's kind of magic that, oh, this one's attractive and this one is not. So we'll explain that to them. Now, some, to a little more sophisticated, I don't care how old he or she is, in my mind, they look like they're a minor. Okay, that's a little more sophisticated, but point out that that doesn't mean they're not attractive. Obviously, the younger the child becomes, the worse they feel. And um, let me uh, apologize for the next picture. I'd like you to look at this picture. Uh, two of the pictures are from John, are John Benet. And the last is uh, from Toddlers and Tiaras, the show in which all the mothers should be arrested. Uh, however, the show does is great for those of us doing exposure with this form of OCD. What do you notice about these images? Well, obviously, they are sexualized. You cannot look at this image and think, look what they're doing to that kid. This is like they sexualize her. But for me to say that, I'm recognizing that there's something sexual there. I may or might not be aroused, but I can see there's a sexual aspect to it. And you know what? The little girl on the right, seriously, she has good likes. Now, obviously, we don't like to look and go like, you know, I mean, if you look, seriously, look at her legs. 
they are good legs. Doesn't mean you're necessarily attracted to them, but you might notice they're good legs. Just in the same way you may be perfectly gay or perfectly straight, and you may look at somebody who's not your normal sexual object and you can say, they're good looking, even though you aren't overtly attracted. If I have OCD, I have that thought, and it's like, why am I thinking that? I, I, why am I thinking she has good legs? It's a sexual, you know, they're, they're just looking at the picture and recognizing that there's something sexual about it makes me think, am I a pervert? What am I thinking? So again, non sufferer you look at it, you think it's just a thought. You don't worry that I'm looking at it, you know what, maybe, maybe the fact I notice this means that underneath I'm really a pedophile and I've really just put that away and suppressed it, but it's just waiting there to come out. So what I would say to myself is like, well, I hope that's not the case. If it is, I hope I deal with it before I do anything. You know, so we assume it's not going to become part of a repertoire. Again, with OCD, I look at it and it's like, what is wrong with me? Again, I am going to talk to them and saying, this is not going to help you know. We're pointing out that, you know, people with, you know, that when you do this, the best we get is as near as you can tell you don't have a current plan. When I say current plan, not like maybe you do, it has to be you have a plan so that you feel is as definite as you believe this couch or pillow is next to you in my office. Again, in discussing their rituals with them. A lot of them will do body checks. Like, you know, hey, is that little girl attractive? You know, am I having a physical response? Am I having a tingling down there. Now, I have to tell them this disappointing news for them. If you think about sex enough in relation to anything, whether you like it or not, you may get a response. I can describe a sex scene to anyone of something they don't like, and depending on how I describe it, I can make it arousing. You know, and I, I tell them that, you know, one of the horrible and truly horrible nightmares for many rape victims that during the weight rape, they may lubricate, they may even have orgasm. They in no way enjoy that experience. Right? The body just sometimes responds independent of everything else. Now, and again, for the victim, this is a nightmare because in an almost OCD-like way, it's like, what is wrong with me? Why did that happen? To help them understand, like, you had no choice. So, Checking your body to see if this stuff is exciting tells us nothing. I will do, I will graphically ask them a question, and I'm graphically asking it for a reason, which I'll go over in a second. I will say, now, if you tell me that your favorite masturbation fantasy is burying your head in an eight-year-old's crotch, and I mean that you know that this is the fantasy, like you don't wonder, like you know it is and it would just be the best thing in the world and you use it every night when you masturbate, all right, I'm going to worry a little bit, a little bit, because the fact you have this fantasy still does not mean you're a pedophile. Studies show that many people have sexual fantasies and behaviors that they truly would never want to happen. It's normal. But if you had this, I would definitely ask you more questions. Now, I'm not even necessarily at the point of asking them to agree to living with uncertainty. But I will then ask them, I have a question. Suppose we find out, like tomorrow you wake up and like, you know that you're attracted to 10-year-olds. You suddenly realize like, wow, those little bodies are just great. The little legs, the cute hands, that little bit of baby fat, oh my God. I mean, now mind you, would you have to rape them because you have that feeling? I understand you would not like having the feeling, but you have to act on it. And I would ask them in the present day, when you see someone attractive who you think is suitable, you know, not, not, you know, do you rape them? Do you hit on every male or female that you think is interesting? Why not? You can have feelings and actually not give in to those feelings. Now. Obviously, I suggest that if you actually have these fantasies, you don't share them, but how would you decide to live with them? Now, this, of course, is an idea that they find repelling. But when you talk about living with uncertainty, 
basically it always means how would you try to cope in a positive way with your worst fears. So although I'm asking this question in hopes of getting them to agree to just doing treatment, I'm sneakily doing some exposure. I'm asking them to imagine, you know, because they want to kill themselves, and I would be evil. I understand the thought you'd find repellent. Would you be evil? Uh, and again, you know, it's an interesting religious question, and of course there may be some scrupulosity overlaid into their OCD, and that's an entire another discussion that we might have time for you, uh, we'll see. But in, in that discussion, like, so anybody who has an evil thought should go to hell, should be damned. I understand you don't want to be evil, but like, it doesn't mean that you necessarily have to do it. I, I would think that if you actually know with 100% certainty that you want to do this, okay, we might want to change some of your behaviors to put you in less frightening situations. But we still want to help you live with these consequences. Now, you know, it gets to the point where you actually do it, I hope you confess for your own sake and for the sake of the other ones around you. You know, you come close, you know, but we can deal with that. When you know that, let's deal with that problem. For now, since you don't have a current plan, we're going to pretend it is just OCD. People can be really hard on themselves. There was a woman who felt she should be punished because maybe 20 years ago she molested her nephew. Now, just between you and me, she didn't. It was kind of an obsessive thought, like, how do I know I didn't? But she thought, even if I may have, I should be punished. And it, she, it took weeks. Because, you know, I kept wanting to say, but if you didn't, should you be punished? That I may have done it. And the only thing that broke this for her is that if her sister was in the same situation, that is where she may have done it, but there was no evidence and nobody can remember. Even though she may have done it, should her sister be punished and never forgiven? She was not willing to punish her sister. We could talk about a double standard. If she shouldn't be, then why should you be? And that was the turning point that allowed her then to then do treatment. For exposure, we're going to expose them to pictures. Again, toddlers and tiaras. Great show for this. You may have to only find it on the net now. And not only do you want them to watch the show, I give them a more difficult side. I want you to watch the show and tell me what parts of the kids were good looking. You know, what looked sexy on the little three-year-old. I want them to go to malls and watch kids. I would send them to schoolyards and playgrounds, but I actually don't want to get them arrested, so we don't do that. We will go into stores together and we will handle children's underwear. You know, we'll have this little discussion like, oh, what do you want to get your nephew? Meanwhile, I'm having them hold the clothes and handling the crotch. If, if that's, you know, effective for them. Um, an exposure I've often used, and this one is like some people, this is horrifying, other people truly don't care. That little picture of uh, those three pictures I showed you earlier, I'll make little versions of them and I'll cut out their crotches and have them eat the crotches. Some people, it's like, eh, it does nothing. Other people are like absolutely horrified by that. We're going to put environmental reminders around. Okay, they will put little dots and they'll set alarms on the thing. And the dot is a reminder to think about your pedophile thoughts. If they have a family, I don't want them to avoid either ba bathing or changing diapers. Uh, or, you know, if they're, you know, I had one young man who, uh, he, he had a nephew and he was going to be at their house uh, babysitting and he was worried about changing diapers. So I hope I don't feel weird. And we all looked at, he was in group, he would all look at him and so I'm like, of course you're going to feel weird. You know, I have a grandson, I change his diaper about once a week, so I'm not doing it frequently enough. And you know what? It's weird changing a diaper. You know, your hand, you're rubbing his little penis and his balls, and you're, you're putting that cream on his rear end and rubbing it all around. It's weird. It's not possible to do that and have no thoughts unless, you know, unless you get to do it, you know, all the time like I did with my son. I was doing it all the time. You know, and again, remind them that testing to see where you're getting that genital tingle while you're doing everything this tells us nothing. That until you say, I know this is what I want, we have no proof. There never will be any proof. We will do what I call scripts. Right? It's basically imaginal exposure. Imagine that they give in. Now, in the scripts that I do, it's important that, one, 
we got a horrific cases, but their worst horrific case, not not the one that you might make up. I can always make something up way more horrific than they can. I want to keep it to like what their worst one is. And again, you know, their worst situation, I can do this hierarchically. You know, I can have them molest their children. I can have them looking at children or their children because right, parents really don't like the idea of molesting their own kids. I can have them do, you know, just like I'm suddenly excited by my child. How am I going to live with this? Why am I going to let myself live with this risk? Why am I taking this risk? And that is critical in the script. We're not just doing the exposure to the horrible thing. We want to teach them how we want them to think about why am I taking this risk? You know, well, we're going to talk about their values. I have this family. I want to have a life. Um, Later on, I'm going to show you two of the slides that have some forms that help to uh, find some of the information you'll be putting into this. You know, because let's say I'm not a pedophile, and I act like when I've had children, I, I may waste my whole life not only not enjoying their childhood, but being absent from them, not being a good parent. You know, and and I might miss their entire life. And what what harm might I do acting like that? You know, so. We're hoping that they cope with the idea that maybe I'm a pedophile, but trying to do everything. You never get to know. Um, and now we get to the slide. Are you still paying attention? Because I'm going to leave now pedophiles and, and get to for some reason, I love violence more than pedophilia. Again, violent thoughts. You know, I have these thoughts. What do my thoughts mean? Will I do this? Am I evil? Anything that makes me think of the violence, I want to avoid. I don't want to watch crime dramas. I don't want to watch the news. I don't want to see the color red. The color red makes me think about blood. And well, if I think about blood, that's terrible, you know, I know what I'm saying, like knives or hammers, you know, suffer is healed, depraved, crazy, and evil. And um, I want to go back a little bit about creativity. Again, remember, creativity is looking for danger. And I will tell this to people, going back to pedophile just for a minute, a min you know, a minute. And let's say parents who are pedophile, worrying about being pedophile. You know, as a parent, you desperately want to protect your children and make everything okay. And all parents worry about their kids. We all worry too much. OCD always takes it a step higher. I can protect my kids from everything. Now, one form of OCD is I'm going to be panicked about illness for my kids to try to protect them. Another, I'm going to worry about them getting kidnapped. But OCD is clever. What would be the worst thing? What if I'm the source of danger? How do I protect my kids if it's me? OCD is so clever because, like, how do I protect them if it's me? So, creativity with the OCD, violence is kind of the same. There are a few reasons. Oh, excuse me, I have to get out one of my props. Good. Um, again, with, with, with violence, I'm going to start with the normalcy of violence. I will ask them this question. Stephen King was once asked, why do you write such horrible things? What was his answer? Very simply, his answer was, why do you think, not what makes you think I have a choice? Not that he is a killer, not that he has OCD, but the questions of good and evil. What is the good in me? What is the evil in me? What is the good and evil in others? Is interesting to him. Because it's interesting that that's what he writes about it. That's what he writes about. He would have these thoughts whether or not he was a writer. How do we know that everyone thinks this? Stephen King is rich. Here you are worrying and making yourself crazy, and he's getting rich on the same things. How many TV shows focus on this problem? Can OCD is a very philosophical disorder. People ask all the important questions of life. 
all the questions philosophers ask. What is the evil in me? What is the evil in others? How do I live in a world where disaster can happen in every, at any moment? What is the nature of God? How do I know who I am? My sexuality, what is my sexuality? What am I? The only difference between OCDers and great philosophers is one difference. People with OCD actually want an answer. And think about it. Think of any of the great philosophers. They write tomes and tomes to try to understand things, things that are so complicated that their answers are so difficult to understand that other people spend their lives just studying that one philosopher. It doesn't boil down to a simple, like, here's the answer. Okay, cool, got it. Don't have to worry. People with OCD actually want the answer. And think about it, you know, again, TV shows, You know, I, I like to show this slide of True Blood. It goes right in this TV show. It's an HBO show. And uh, right in there were good vampires. And, you know, and, and so the heroine, uh, every TV show, would have to have sex with a good vampire because it's HBO, and they have to show that. But in their sex, as you can see in the pictures, pretty much every time they did it, he chomped down and blood would come pouring out. Except in this show, this is a good thing. This is like a great part of their sex. And people love this show. People love the romance between them, between these two. And the person thinks their thoughts are weird. Seriously? Like, what's weird about that? Dexter. Hey, let's watch a show about a serial killer who we kind of like watching him kill people because he's only killing bad people. But he's still a serial killer. I'm very serious when I say I want the person to imagine the worst happening and trying to cope with it. So imagine a situation. Okay. Imagine tonight if I slice and dice my wife, Kathy. What if that happens tonight? I mean, I don't have a plan to do it now, but what happens if I go nuts? Because let's face it, no matter what I'm thinking now, what I'm feeling now, I can't know what's going to happen to me tonight. I might go crazy and do that to her. I always carry a knife with me. I'm sure that's comforting to everyone. I always carry a knife with me. So what if I do that? Well, let's see. What if I do do that? One of two things is going to be true. I wake up the next morning, and I'm no longer crazy. So now, all right, I'm going to be miserable, obviously. I don't know how my son's going to feel about me. We are going to have to send me to prison because, like, I went nuts, and we don't know why I did it or whether I'm going to do it again. But sooner or later in prison, although I will always feel bad at killing her, I'm going to have to accept it. Accept that in a way like it wasn't me and I was crazy. Not that I'm happy about it, not that I don't miss her, but like I need to make a good life for myself in prison. Or, you know, they figure out what's wrong with me when they let me out. Scenario two, I wake up and I am still crazy. So my first job is try to get the hell out of here because I don't want to go to prison. And if they catch me, I still have to make a good life for myself in prison, except I don't have to deal with the guilt. Note my language when I'm talking about this. I purposely say, I don't say, what if I kill my wife? I say, what if I slice and dice Kathy? That, 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 that bizarre wording, right, with a touch of very dark humor in it, that's diffusing. I'm taking it and I'm taking it out of the normal context. There are lots of blatant and subtle ways to diffuse. So some of the outrageous ways that a behavior act in therapy are really part of helping that person get distance from their fear. To look at it as like, okay, this is a thought. Let's look at that thought. Not that it's just a thought, you know. I can think about killing people. It doesn't mean I will or won't. So, what are we going to do for exposure? You know, by the way, I always have a collection of knives in my office, and um, I will often give these to people. Uh, it, it's kind of fun in our OCD group, when we find somebody with this, we get to give this to them. And we'll have it over, either hold it over somebody's wrist, you know, or just sit there like this the entire group. I will have people hold this over my wrist. Often I'll sneakily do this in an early first session 
uh, framing it as this is just I want to see how you respond. I'm actually kind of doing exposure, but the frame makes all the difference. We're not really doing exposure. We're just like checking this out. Oh, are you getting comfortable with this? I do warn them these are really sharp knives. Don't mess around because you will cut me. What other exposures can we do, right? Okay, you know, do they have trouble with the color red? You know, do they have trouble with words, murder, whatever? If they have trouble with words, I have them write it on themselves in black magic marker, indelible. You know, write it like on their foot. Someplace where no one will see it, but they know it's there. Again, with this, there are just so many wonderful movies to watch, Violence, the News, Silence of the Lambs, whatever they're being, whatever they're avoiding. Again, they may be avoiding social situations. We'll put them in those situations. They may be avoiding children because anything that looks so helpless and make, makes them think more about killing, which makes sense because, again, as soon as you say something is helpless, it means you're recognizing, I have a lot of power over that. Many people don't realize that it's normal when holding a newborn baby to think about killing it. Now, if you're thinking that's not true, anybody who holds a newborn goes, oh, it's so little, it's so helpless. Look at those tiny feet. When you say it's so little, you have the thought like, it's life is in my hands. To say it's life is in my hands is to recognize I can kill it. Now, non-sufferance have that thought and just pops through their heads like, yeah, whatever, I, I don't need that. A little more thought is like, oh, yeah, I'm having that thought, but it's just a thought. OCD people, oh, my God, why am I thinking this? And, of course, the reason they don't know this is a normal thought because those of us, most of us, are socialized. It's not good for me to say when my grandson was born to my uh, daughter, like, wow, Jack is so cute. You know how easy it would be for me to kill Jack? This would not be a, create a good you know, father-daughter-in-law relationship. We know not to say that. So it seems like it's not there. Um, again, the imaginal exposure. We're going to have them imagine you know, going through this. Why take the risk? Again, what are all the reasons we're going to have them take the risk? You know, what is, you know, and again, rituals don't prevent you from killing someone. You can keep all the knives out of the house or keep them locked up somewhere. It doesn't mean you're not going to go get, get it and kill them later. Because obviously, if you're going crazy, you might do this. You know, the only way I can prevent from killing my wife is not live with her. What if I'm not really a killer? What a sad waste. And of course, there's always the other possibility, which she doesn't have to worry about me killing her. Because she's the one who's going to go crazy and kill me. I want to read you um, something one of my patients wrote. Um, you know, I, 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 people often ask, who should make the script, me or the client? Generally, I would love for clients to make the scripts, but I make better ones. So initially, I'm going to make the script. I'm going to record it. Um, and how often should they listen to it? My thought is not like you listen an hour a day. You listen all the time. Anywhere where you can wear headphones, you listen. If people know you have this problem, you wear it during family dinner. You have the volume low enough so you can still hear the other talk, but it's there in the background. OCD never rests. Why should they? Why should treatment rest? There's some places you can't wear headphones. Fine, you don't wear it. So I'm going to have active listening. That is, you're going to actually sit there and listen. And other times, passive listening. Um, so this is a little bit long when I'm about to read you. This is uh, what one of my clients wrote uh, for his exposure. Uh, and this is a little intellectual. Um, so it's not as emotional as some of them as I would make, but on the other hand, I just like the way he thinks. So here's what he wrote. You will get persistent thought questions that you judge too crazy, evil, weird, bizarre, twisted. The list, what are the most depraved thing I can imagine? A cannibal. Silence of the Lamb, Hannibal Lecter, creepiest villain monster ever. Of course I'll ask, what if that's in me? Off to the races I go. Be sure to include flesh-eating ghoul, zombie, werewolf, vampire, depraved monster, insane madman, body part-eating psychopath, people-eating monster, crazy man, twisted lunatic, normal on the outside, but crazy on the inside guy, weirdest guy on the planet. What if, for no reason, I attack a defensive person? What if my anxiety fear made me lose control, snap, or change? What if I bit a stranger? My own children, my wife, essentially anyone. What if I bit someone with the intention of eating them? What if deep down I liked it? What if this is a premeditated secret I've been suppressing? What if some invisible hand takes control of me like some Cartesian machine? What if the what if thoughts and the graphic images of attacking, biting, eating people get stuck in my head forever? What if the images of body parts, blood, skin being ripped from the bone, shark teeth taking out giant chunks of flesh get stuck in my head? 
I can have these thoughts in my head while doing anything, including but not limited to working, running, being at the store, at the supermarket, watching TV with my kids, being in a restaurant, holding a baby in my arms, making love, talking on the phone, being on a plane, being totally alone, gardening, anywhere. And this can and will go on as long as they please. And it is okay. Let them come. Any and all attempts to get rid of them or figure them out ensures their presence and guarantees my suffering. Any thought that I try to get rid of or resolve can fall into the category of OCD. But what if it's not OCD? I have to take the chance that I might be totally 100% crazy and be free. If I needed the, an answer, the only response is maybe. Maybe I can and maybe I will lose control. Maybe these bizarre thoughts reveal some dark heat hidden secret about me. Maybe if I get too anxious, I will change or snap. Maybe some invisible hand will take control of me like a Cartesian machine. Maybe these images and this feeling of peril will never go away and will be stuck in my head to the exclusion of all else, and I will live in a state of peril and anxiety for the rest of my life. Maybe deep down, I'm that weird, crazy, twisted person, or maybe I'm normal, but have that in me. In reality, it is not a maybe at all. I do have crazy, evil, and bizarre in me. It is a part of me, it is a part of being human. The imp of the mind, that little devil inhabiting all human minds, cross culture and across time, that can or does take you to the darkest thing that you can possibly imagine, imagine being or imagining doing, is there. Everyone has a primal side. Again, it's not a yes or no proposition. Rather, it is a part of me, a part of everyone, including Jeffrey Dahmer and Mother Teresa. The dark revelation. What if, it is, what if it is in me that I feared, dreaded, and obsessed over for so long is revealed? It's a yes. And ironically, there's freedom for me in this. I embrace it. These thoughts and doubts, including all of the bizarre, crazy ones, are natural. They're part of me. Think of Star Wars, Jekyll and Hyde. This is nothing new, except, except that maybe I'm a little crazy and that there's no guarantee I'm not 100%. And if I was 100% crazy, you know what? Maybe I wouldn't be so anxious. Maybe I'd feel better to be crazy and evil. And I'd enjoy these thoughts and fear and fear and not dread them. Maybe these thoughts wouldn't bother me. Dare I say I would actually enjoy them and I wouldn't have to worry about all this fucking OCD rules? Two things I get from my own essay exposure. First of all, these bizarre thoughts, questions, and images must be allowed to be there in my head. One of the big what-if questions is then answered. What if these thoughts get stuck in my head? The answer is yes, they will, and that's going to have to be okay. I'm going to have to always move on without the attempt to get rid of them. Second, what if these thoughts reveal that I have a dark side? It's another yes, I have a dark side. It's a part of me. It is me. The natural is the air and sky. Still, there are no guarantees. That being said, there are no guarantees. No 100% guarantee that I will not act on my worst thought that I'm normal. They, you know, that there's no guarantee they'll go away. They may not, and that is okay. Nonetheless, uncertainty offers me freedom and hope. I can think and free myself from the OCD burden of trying to figure it out and get rid of it. I like this approach. You know, one of the things about OCD, the worst part of it often is not the stimulus, not the thing the person is afraid of, but the effort in trying to fix it. People mistakenly feel the worst thing is that stimulus I fear, the dirt, seeing the knife, having the thought. Actually, in their worst moments of pain, the worst was trying to get rid of it. I have two slides right now that I want to show you. It's what I call ERP motivators. I'm going to kind of get their values and, and things to include in the script. The first part is, what have I lost to OCD? Notice there are a bunch of categories. And um, the categories are not like, yes, I have this. I want them to write down their most painful moments. What is the most horrifying times in any or all of these situations? This is what I'm going to include in my script. This is why I don't want to be OCD, because remember when I did that and the pain that came from that, and I don't want that to happen again. You'll notice it says where you can obtain these slides for, for free and pretty much every other form that was in my uh, book. And the second one is very similar to the first one, except that one is now, how have I hurt my loved ones? And again, trying to figure out all the ways of doing that. And the next really important slide um, yeah, it might be the last one of these. It's the W slide. 
the famous, now you can get your CE credits and you don't have to listen for the next 20 minutes if you choose to run away. But I, I'm hoping I'm doing a little better than that. Um, I want to talk a little bit about mindfulness uh, before we go to questions. Uh, mindfulness, when do I use mindfulness and what do I mean for, by mindfulness? Again, our society, mindfulness often gets that kind of like, again, that Eastern bliss, I'm going to be relaxed and everything is nirvana and it's really cool and that is not mindfulness. Frequently, I do not use mindfulness. I do not use it with all clients, although everybody with OCD is horribly anxious. For many people, deciding to confront the uncertainty and accept the uncertainty of their fears, that work really copes with the anxiety and they don't need to do anything special about it. There is a subgroup for whom the anxiety and fear is so great that that is equally something they are terrified and interferes with treatment. They, they cannot, they, they, it, it, it is overwhelming for them to, to go on. So for them, I'm going to do my mindfulness, and again, I'm going to be partially modifying it. Okay, my, again, the first thing, mindfulness is not to make you feel good. Mindfulness is that there are definitely stressful situations, and we want to help you not make the stress work worse. So we want to help you with your anxiety, and I want you to know that initially you are in kindergarten when we do this mindfulness. What do I mean by that? If you knew, if you didn't know how to read and I start teaching you to read today, well, it's going to suck. Here you are, you can understand really complicated stories and you're reading C. J. Jane Run. That's where we are with mindfulness. And, you know, I will explain, right? Anxiety. You know, the, this terrible thing you feel, you know, it's made up of two things. It's made up of thoughts and sensations, right? You have to have both of them together for you to feel off the walls. Now, unfortunately, or fortunately, the sensations are literally just that. Your heart's beating. All these things are happening in your body that feel really terribly aversive because this is basically an alarm system going off. It's going off at the wrong time. It has no meaning. But it really doesn't matter that it has no meaning. It feels really horrible. So even if you know that it's completely harmless and nothing bad will happen, another part of it says, I don't care. Just make it stop. Of course, trying to make it stop just makes it worse. Because you say things like, I can't handle this. I obviously can't because you're still here, but that's way too logical. So we're going to do mindfulness. And in our mindfulness, you know, we're not going to, we're purposely not addressing the thought side of this issue. We're taking a temporary break. I'm not saying it's not there. I'm not saying focus away. I'm basically saying, I'm going to deal with that part another time. Basically, but what if I am a killer? Like, we're going to deal with that. But right now, I just want you to focus on this because we want to just deal with the emotions. I want to get you to the point where you're having this horrible anxiety and it just really sucks. Can I imagine this two situation. I have two people with a headache. One has hypochondriac and they think they have brain cancer and the other has a headache. Now, if I help that person who's hypochondriac and think it's not brain cancer because they're really are wild, when we get them to that point where it's just a headache, well, it still sucks. It's just not as bad. We want to help you get to that point. So we are going to do deep breathing. But we're not doing that to relax you. You might get relaxed. I actually don't care. We're doing it because you're in kindergarten, and this is the very first step. And again, we're going to do the focusing on the sensations and all of those other things. But we're doing it because eventually I'm going to have you in full horrible anxiety, and I want you to experience all of those things and get to experience them just as sensations. Now, I have a question to ask you. Imagine you are in your worst panic time. I mean, it is just slamming you. And I tell you, and for some magic reason, you know this is true. Five minutes, it's all going to be over. Never going to bother you again. All going to stop. How will you be during that five minutes? Then pretty much everyone says, well, you know, I think I'd be okay. And it's like, do you understand how amazing this is? Because let's say it's during that five minutes, it's exactly the same as always. And the only thing is, James, is a piece of knowledge. You know, and let's face it, it's not just that knowledge, because if I subject you to the most horrible physical torture I can come up with, I'm sorry, five minutes may be better than five hours, but it is not going to be tolerable. So what has happened, what this knowledge has done, is it's changed your mind, and basically because it's not for every, you made a decision. You made a decision, all right, for five minutes, I'll put up with it. But that's, remember, it's the exact same feeling either way. So 
part of this is to get you in that five minute frame of mind. Not the it's over in five minutes because you know unfortunately you're not stupid. It's to get you in a point of oh okay I can put up with this. So right, OCD can be a devastating problem. It can be really hard to work on. I would like to point out that if they work on their OCD, they won't be normal. They will be better than normal. The average person doesn't really cope that well with uncertainty. People with OCD, they kind of have the heaven or hell choice. They might like to deny like everyone else, but they either have to be in hell from trying to deny and failing, or they learn to accept and they actually are accepting uncertainty because you know, in the same way, eventually, once they get through their OCD, we will continue doing act like work. Uncertainty is everything in life. This is not just for OCD, it's for everything. At this point, I am ready for questions. Okay, great. Thank you so much. We do have some questions that are in. Uh, the first one is, what are developmental considerations for explaining uncertainty to children with OCD? Is there any argument for psychoeducation for a young child that might be conceptualized as reassurance for older clients? Yes. <laughs> I, I think, um, and, and it depends on the child, of course. I mean, I think, you know, certainly with adolescents, usually mo most of them are advanced enough, I can say this. I think when I get to the tween ages, it's going to be a judgment. And younger children, I might actually say, um, that these are just thoughts or, or you know, I talk about the OCD monster. Uh, it's going to be a very individual judgment with that child. Um, so, so yes, I will take that consideration. I have, depending on the child, I did have a 10 year old who was worried about their parents dying. That particular child, I, I judged could handle the idea like, yes, maybe your parents will die. Another 10 year old, I would never do that. So that is the brief answer to that is the, the actual factors you know, I think it's a complicated set of clinical judgments. I, you know, I, I think the one problem is that, you know, in general, working with OCD, even with adults, people are overly cautious. Um, so although I would be cautious with kids, um, I, I still would want to kind of ramp up my standard a little bit more from normal. Okay. Um, and a similar question that came in is, um, how might you adapt these interventions for a pediatric adolescent or teen population? Generally, teens or adolescents, I, I don't really change the, um, I'm going to pretty much do the exact same thing. Again, you know, most, most of the time, you know, people with OCD are pretty intellectually sophisticated in their own way. I, you know, I mean, they may have some, you know, certainly I can have somebody from a very religious background and they may have a very narrow view of the likelihood of these things, so explaining that these are normal thoughts may be a surprise to them, but uh, with teenagers, I'm generally going to do the same as I do with adults. Okay, and can you speak to balancing ERP with safety assessments for SIHI? Self-injury and HI, harming, which, which was the other one you said? Um, it was SI and HI was how it was written. HI. Um, well, yes, I am going to make Final an ideation and homicidal ideation. Um, I mean, I will, I, I will assess it, and um, I have to hear. You know, just as I asked the uh, the person, "Hey, is your favorite fantasy, you know, burying your head in the crotch of an eight-year-old?" Uh, I might ask the person. You know, is some part of you think like it would really be great to choking the life out of somebody and watching their eyes bulge as they like suffocate? Um, you know, if they say yes to that, yeah, then I'm going to be concerned. Um, I actually think assessing their their ability to do harm to others is pretty simple, and I, I think it's pretty straightforward that it's it's OCD. I think it, it would be so blatant when it is not. Uh, that I'm not worried. For self-injury, uh, it is kind of the same thing. Uh, I, you know, I'll ask, you know, are you actively suicidal or are you worried about it? And, I, you know, I, I think that people who don't work with OCD are way more cautious. I think it's actually very simple and it's really only two or three questions to find that out. I have had uh, one or two cases where 
uh, somebody had come to me, they were actually sent to me, where uh, at one point in their life they had fear of committing suicide, but then they actually became suicidal. So yes, doing, doing uh, exposure with them is a little different, and I would make modifications for that. I uh, have not had the trouble with uh, homicidal people. I have had two people with a pedophile background have pedophile OCD on top of that. So, I mean, the modifications are, are pretty simple. I'm not going to expose them to toddlers and tiaras or something, so we're going to, we will actually knock down because we now have a, something that's kind of a combination addiction as well as an OC fear, so I'm going to basically treat it like I would any addiction in terms of having them in safe situations. Um, but again, I have to hear, I really like this material, or I actually did it, as opposed to I'm afraid I like it. Can you say a little more about how ERP leads to better tolerance of uncertainty? How do you explain this connection to clients? I, I believe uh, ERP, I mean, wonderful thing about ERP is even done poorly, uh, ERP is helpful most of the time. Um, but ERP does not magically help somebody cope with uncertainty. Again, if I do ERP and I have not explicitly discussed this with the client, uh, it's probably not going to lead to it all. The, the thing that's going to help increase their tolerance to uncertainty is, one, that they've agreed that this is the goal of ERP. You know, I think in the old days, ERP was thought to be just this very straightforward behavioral habituation or extinction procedure. It's really a very cognitive procedure. And, you know, so the very fact I'm trying to do this actually influences me. And as I get, as I'm doing the exposure, I mean, right, some level of the fear does go down. Uh, but we're interpreting the level of fear going down, not that it's safe, but that I'm becoming more comfortable with the uncertainty. And also one of the things with many people, when they decide to do exposure, one of the things that they find incredibly wonderful is they're not going to do rituals. I mean, because that's also part of treatment. And the amount of rituals they get out of, that is such a relief for many people that um, life is much more fun. So as they, the idea, it's really that trade-off of, well, this is what it is in every part of my life. I don't want to die, I might die at any time. I don't want to kill, I might kill at any time. So I think the way I've set up the situation combining with this exposure is what leads to uh, more acceptance of uncertainty. There's nothing, w without that setup, it's not going to happen. I hope that's clear. Thank you. Um, do, you do you use any self-report scales to measure uncertainty and progress in tolerating it? If so, which ones? No. Um, I, this is a terror. I, I think that um, technically, if I, if I say the right thing, um, one should always be assessing treatment with scales um, and, and because that way, of, you know, at that moment I decide to do research, I have all of this data uh, that is more than just my opinion. I do think in actuality, most of the time, um, the self-report with me is, a, is enough of a measure if I'm not doing research. Um, so I'm a little bad and don't do that. Uh, when you know, a person saying, I'm more comfortable, uh, I, I'm going to go on the assumption they're not lying to me. Okay. Uh, you mentioned studies show, I have treated a number of very young males, age 15 to 18, with homo and or pedophile OCD, who are really ignorant and not well educated about their body, sex, and reproduction. I certainly do ERP, including both uncertainty exposures and situational and imaginal exposures, the idea of having sex with members of the same gender or minors. However, I've also provided information about sexuality, such as from Kinsey's old studies um, about that fairly few people exclusively have sexual interests and fan fantasies and activities solely with members of the other gender. I've also sometimes had them read a basic sex education book, such as It's Perfectly Normal. What do you think of that? Do you ever do the same? Do you have a more recent go-to book study? I think what that person doing is great, uh, and I do cite some of that literature. Um, I haven't had people so ignorant of it that me explaining in session is not enough, but I certainly think 
I'm going to have to get actually what book they use when they, they want to do that. Um, right, because it, it, again, for the person with these fears, saying that this is normal is still scary. You know, and I, I, I've had the experience where, you know, right before, again, I won't, I won't do exposure if they haven't accepted that this is what my goal is. So I remember somebody that's like, they didn't like the idea that they might be somewhere in the middle of that scale. You know, they had to know, like, like I don't know, if this is, this is bisexual and this is 100%, you know, straight. Well, they were okay if they're somewhere way up there, but it doesn't, you know, there's some imaginary place it couldn't be. And, of course, how could they know they were there? So that particular information actually fosters coping with uncertainty. So, yeah, I'm happy with it. Thank you for that. Um, next question. Everything I've read has the individual create a hierarchy of fears, and you're supposed to start at around a five on the SUD scale. Do you just jump in at the top of the, the SUDs? There are two answers to that question. One, where I jump in uh, as a kind of a matter of clinical intuition, I will see what I can get away with. So some people it's really clear to me I'm going to start low. I know the people I see I can get away with going very high, you know, so if I can get away with it, I will do that. Um, I think when somebody is not experienced with treatment, then it makes sense to start, you know, like at that 50 mark, you know, that halfway mark, uh, just until you get more experience to be able to feel your way of like, yeah, I can, I can do this and not explode them to pieces versus, you know, oh yeah, we can do this. So. Uh, there's not a rule, it's a clinical intuition, and in the absence of intuition, I would do a hierarchy. Hey, we have so many questions. Um, could you please elaborate on the example you spoke of at the start of the talk about a client fearing that her thoughts can kill and indeed lost her father? So, so wait, say that again? Um, could you please elaborate on the example you spoke of at the start of the talk, the one about the client fearing that her thoughts can kill and then her father did in fact die? Um, I'm not sure what you would like me to elaborate. I, you know, the, the, the issue for the person is they were afraid that maybe their thoughts could kill people. And um, again, my argument was maybe it could. You have a low hit rate. Um, we convinced her to take the risk in treatment. And um, when, when her father died, people always want to know, what happened to her? So. either through wonderful skill, but probably not, or luck. Um, when he died, although she was upset, and although the question hit, like, did I do this or not, for the most part, her personal experience was probably not. Because she, you know, she didn't go the, like, oh, my God, I did this, which she could have done, and we would have had to probably spend a few weeks working on. Um, but in her case, she was willing to... Maybe I did, I hope I didn't, and continued doing the treatment. Um, I would not, I mean, it would certainly be more difficult if it happened, but I would still have, uh, I, I, it would have slowed treatment down, certainly, but um, we would have kind of gone with, you never get to know whether this was a coincidence or you caused it. Um, which I could, and I would point out, I could say this for the death of every loved one in the world. None of us get to know, and the only difference between me and you is you ask the question. Doesn't mean that I didn't kill my father. So we're hoping we want you to learn to live with that, and I hope that answers this person's question. Okay. Next question: Do you use the words OCD, obsessive compulsive disorder, with all kids? If not, why not? And how do you refer to the issue? Yes, I do use the term OCD. I mean, I, I have to clear that with the parents. Um, I find, first of all, and, and as many patients will tell you, having a label for it makes them feel less crazy, on the most part. It's like, oh, this isn't like the John Grayson disease. This is like a lot of people have this. Now, certainly there would be, there are some adults as well as kids who are going to have difficulty with that idea and we may have to spend time with it um, and, and kind of normalizing it or why it's, you know, why is it going to be okay you have this? Um, but they actually do have it. 
so they're going to find out, and I, I so yeah, I want I would I, I try to help them cope with that. Um, I, I will find ways to make it sound well. To, I think realistic ways of like why they will be able to cope with it, and 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 certainly that the way they're feeling at this moment is not how having OCD does not mean feeling this way always. It does mean just to throw in yes, you know. You always have the problem, and you're going to always have to deal with slips, and that's an entire another talk, because uh, I don't want them to think that just because we've gotten through this part of treatment, treatment is over. Uh, but that's that's another talk. Okay, thank you. And unfortunately, we do have to wrap up now. There are about a hundred more questions that have come in, and I'm so sorry that we can't get to more. Um, uh, but if folks do want to continue the discussion, I highly recommend that you jump on over to the um, new ADAA online community. There's a, a community within that set up specifically for our um, OCD special interest group, so you can certainly continue the discussion there. And um, also the, the ADAA OCD special interest group conducts a monthly online peer consultation on the third Tuesday of each month. You can contact me for more details. Um, so I just want to say thank you so much to Dr. Grayson. This was just an incredible presentation. And thank you to our participants for taking the time. We actually, this is a bit longer than our normal webinar, so thank you for taking the time out of your day to attend. In about one hour, you'll receive an email that includes an evaluation of today's presentation. We really appreciate your feedback as we work to strengthen this webinar series. And the email will also include a link to um, view the recording so you can go back and um, refer to the presentation as you need to. And I believe Dr. Grayson is going to be sending me the slides to send out to all of you. So I will get those to you as soon as I can. So on behalf of ADAA and our presenter, thank you again and have a wonderful weekend. Thank you.